Hello and welcome back to another space flight video. In this video, I will be talking about the physics of the Falcon 9's free entry, starting at booster separation and ending when the booster lands. For the purposes of this video, I will be using the CRS-18 launch as an example. I'm using that launch because I believe that it is the most recent commercial resupply mission that launched during the day and landed on land. I don't actually know for sure because I was too lazy to research something for this video. That wasn't really necessary, and I mean, who cares if I'm using the most recent launch footage? Anyway, tangents aside, now it's time to talk about how SpaceX stages. During launch, the second stage vacuum optimized Merlin 1D is stored inside a space called an interstage, which is made out of carbon composites and reinforced with aluminum. On the outside of the interstage were latches that connect the interstage and the second stage. During staging, those latches become unlatched and a pneumatic piston is used to shove the second stage away from the first stage. Pneumatic pistons are pistons that use high pressure air to move an object. In a pneumatic piston, you have a rod and a cylinder. The rod has pads on each end that have the same radius as the inside of the cylinder. When gas is moved into the rear end of the cylinder, the air pressure increases on that end of the cylinder. Then that high pressure gas tries to move towards the low pressure zone on the other side of the piston, but there's a pad in the way, so the gas moves the pad, which moves the rod. If you want the rod to retract, then you just move the gas over to the other side of the piston, SpaceX's pneumatic pistons use helium as the working fluid. Next, we have the boost back burn. 14 seconds after main engine cutoff, the Falcon 9 will perform an engine burn that makes it move towards the landing zone. The burn is only performed when the Falcon 9 is trying to land on solid ground, because the drone ship is already positioned in a location that the Falcon 9 can easily land on without any major course corrections. The boost back burn is designed to flip the booster's velocity so that it starts going up and over towards land. When the Falcon 9 performs its boost back burn at the 154 second mark, it is traveling at around 2 km per second, and a lot of that is vertical speed. In order to send its trajectory back to land, it only needs to change its horizontal velocity. These next calculations come from a Reddit user, so you should take these with a grain of salt. According to the Reddit user, it takes 1.3 km per second of delta V to perform a boost back burn. That is the total change in velocity required to cancel out all horizontal velocity and then shove the rocket towards the landing zone. This amount does not include the delta V required to land the Falcon 9 or perform the re-entry burn. The Falcon 9 booster performs the entire burn in about 7.5 seconds, which is incredibly quick. The reason why it accelerates so much faster in this situation is because acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. The Falcon 9 booster has already burned up most of its fuel and it no longer needs to push the second stage or the payload so it is much lighter. The booster is pointed in the correct direction using reaction control system thrusters or RCS thrusters. RCS thrusters are tiny engines on the side of rockets that are used to control attitude. The Falcon 9's reaction control thrusters use liquid nitrogen as a propellant. The liquid nitrogen is kept in high pressure tanks, then when the tank's valves open, the nitrogen leaves the tank at high speeds and evaporates. This gaseous nitrogen then expands out of the thruster and produces the recipes of Newton's third law. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. In this situation, the nitrogen escaping is the reaction, and the rocket turns because of the reaction. The reason why RCS thrusters turn spacecraft is because their thrust doesn't point through the center of mass of the rocket. If they push through the center of mass, then they would translate the rocket because the center of mass is the center of balance. It's like how when you position your finger below a pencil center of mass, the action force produced by gravity pulling down on the pencil is perfectly counteracted by your finger's reaction force pushing up on the pencil. But if your finger wasn't on the center of mass, then gravity would be pulling the middle of the pencil down while your finger pushed the tip of the pencil up. This would cause the pencil to flip around off your finger. On the Falcon 9, the RCS thrusters push the top of the rocket and don't push the bottom of the rocket, so the top moves while the bottom stays motionless. And that is how the Falcon 9 is pointed in space. Also, some control is provided by the engine gimbal, which is when the engine is pointed in different directions so that their thrust isn't going through the center of mass. After the Falcon 9 performs its boost back burn, it performs a re-entry burn. The re-entry burn is designed to slow down the Falcon's velocity to a speed that will allow it to survive re-entry within a certain margin for error. Although SpaceX calls the re-entry burns entry burns instead of re-entry burns. I don't understand why they would do that. The Falcon 9 was in the atmosphere, then it left the atmosphere and came back in which should be called a re-entry, not an entry. The Falcon 9 booster performs its re-entry burn while pointing approximately retrograde, which is the opposite of the direction that it is going in. Sometimes it will point slightly away from retrograde to adjust its trajectory so that it goes in a different direction. Re-entry heating is caused by atmospheric shock waves. When the Falcon 9 performs its re-entry burn, 
and is traveling at approximately Mach 10 or 10 times the speed of sound. When something is traveling through the atmosphere that quickly, it shoves air molecules away from itself. These air molecules bump into other air molecules. Normally, those other air molecules would move out of the way, but these first air molecules are moving so quickly that the other air molecules can't move out of the way in time. These air molecules are compressed together and form a high-pressure region known as a shockwave. Within the shockwave, air molecules are constantly rubbing against each other, which produces heat. This heat is then transferred into the Falcon 9 through radiation. This heat will also ionize air molecules into plasma, which causes the Falcon 9 to lose uplink because radio waves are electromagnetic waves, and plasma is air that is missing electrons. The missing electrons float around near the Falcon 9 booster and interrupt any electrical signals that go by. Many spacecraft that re-enter the atmosphere are painted black because black is better than any other color at radiating away atmospheric heating. However, the Falcon 9 is white because white is better at reflecting solar radiation, and during ascent, the engineers at SpaceX don't want their propellants boiling off because of solar radiation. Or they could just think that white looks better. You never know with Elon Musk. After the Falcon 9 booster performs its re-entry burn, it begins to adjust its trajectory using lift. Lift is produced because air being deflected is an action force, and lift is the reaction force. When a Falcon 9 is pointed directly into the airstream, it produces no lift because each side of the Falcon 9 deflects the same amount of air, so they cancel out. However, if the Falcon 9 is tilted slightly over, it produces lift, which can be used to adjust its trajectory so that it goes closer to the landing zone. The Falcon 9 is moved over by grid fins, positioned at the top of the vehicle. They are hydraulically powered, similar to the pneumatic piston that powers stage separation, except with a liquid instead of a gas. The lift of the Falcon 9 is also used for safety reasons. The Falcon 9 is originally on a trajectory that will make it miss its landing zone. It needs to use lift to hit its target so that if something bad happens, then it doesn't use lift and it splashes harmlessly into the ocean. Also, using lift to adjust its trajectory uses no fuel. Finally, at approximately T plus 470 seconds, the central engine roars to life one final time. This reignition is powered by T-TEB, which is a mixture of triethyl aluminum and triethyl borane, which will explode on contact with oxygen, and it is how they light all of their engines. After this final ignition, there is no more T-TEB left on the rocket, so even if they had enough fuel to relight the engine, they couldn't. This final burn is used to kill off all their remaining velocity, so that the Falcon 9 stops moving and hovers a couple feet above the pad before slamming into the ground. This entire process would be much harder without pintle injectors. Pintle injectors are the pieces of metal in the combustion chamber that allow the propellants to enter the chamber. Unlike most other injectors, pintle injectors double as valves, so that they can close off the combustion chamber and not allow fuel in. This allows for much quicker throttle and shut-off times, because normally, Fuel flow would be shut off only at the fuel tank, which would leave some fuel in the pipes that could still enter the combustion chamber. But pintle injectors also prevent flow from the pipes going into the combustion chamber. Have a nice day and don't die!